Okay, good morning ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the WSP ATR workshop. Um, I think maybe the first thing one should ask is, you know, why does a company like uh, CQ present a WSP ATR workshop? Um, it's very simple. There are quite a few significant changes happening. And uh, if you don't react to it as a HR or training and development professional, you might find that your company might be out of pocket uh, for the next year. So I think that is uh, part of the key things that we'd like to bring across. Just maybe a, a little bit um, about what makes us different. One of the things you'll hear a lot today is uh, um, academics in terms of, this, of skills development. Now one of the things we have done over the years is we have always um, partnered academics with international certification um, to make programs more powerful and make them far more market related. And we've been doing this, uh, yes, for over about eight years ago, we made that decision. We do about 10,000 certi international certifications per year. That's with the qualifications. Um, about close to 5,000 is Microsoft, a lot of it is CompTIA, you get Cisco, you get Adobe, you get Autodesk, and various uh, other certifications. Just to make sure that the skills base that you create is right. So that, that is one of our differentiators. And then we've got fantastic relationships with uh, the international vendors. That, that is one uh, of our strengths. Okay, now let's jump right into the new legislation for the CETA grant regulations. And I know this is not the most exciting topic that uh, one could do a <laughs> workshop on. I understand that. But I think it's essential that we, um, if you don't already know the changes, that you're completely aware of those. Now, we're quickly going to run through them, the regulation the objectives to regulate proportion of funds available for skills development, provide for CETAs to contribute to the QCTO, discourage accumulation of surpluses and carryover of unspent funds, improve quantity and quality of labor market information to inform planning, promote NKF registered pivotal programs to address scarce and critical skills, meet in subsector industries, and create a framework for expanded use of public education and training providers. Now that is a huge mouthful of information. Um, and we're going to unpack that as we go. The key element that you should um, put in your mind is the whole focus of the change in legislation is to get skills at a higher level. And when I say skills, that's really what it's about is to, in terms of our labor market and our labor to get higher level skills. They're not looking at entry level skills. They're not looking at NKF 3, 2 and 3. They're looking more for NKF level 5, 6 type of skills. Um, and that is a key change in the whole strategy. I think those of you who follow our Minister Bladen Samande, he is an absolute champion of this. He's driving this with uh, everything he's got trying to get our labor force at high skills levels. So that is the real reason behind it. Now, let's just quickly look and see what the situation was up to 31 March. Um, and I think all of you are familiar with that. We started with the National Skills Fund. 20% of your skills development levy goes to that. And then always we could claim 50% from our mandatory grant. Um, and those companies that did not uh, compete ATR or WSP um, or it wasn't approved, that money went over to the discretionary grant and they probably made about 20% plus the, uh, the, the leftovers. And then the CETA administration, they put 10% towards that. And that has been the position up to um, 31 March 2013. Now uh, here comes the change. Firstly, National Skills Fund stays exactly the same. So if you access that uh, um, and apply there, the 20% of our skills development levy still goes there. But now, the mandatory grant only gets 20%. So if you do everything you've done in the past, you're only gonna get 20% of your mandatory grant back. 
Now, I just suggest if you didn't know that or you haven't made provision for that in your WSP, you do that quickly within the next two weeks because otherwise your FD might be a little bit unhappy if suddenly they find out they're not going to get a lot of money back. Then your discretionary grant now is 49.5% of which at least 80% goes towards the pivotal um, grant, pivotal training plan. And that is a huge change. We, we haven't seen this before. Um, and of that 49.5, um, approximately 10% could be non-pivotal, and the rest is uh, before the others goes to the pivotal trading plan. And we're going to speak a little bit more about that. It relates very much to scares and critical skills, um, but we'll deal with uh, a lot more detail a little later. The CETA administration gets 10.5%. And some of you might have noticed there's 0.5% missing. That goes to the QCTO. So the QCTO gets funded uh, out of the skills de development levy for the very first time. Um, it was established already a while ago. Um, I think they underestimated the work that has to be done to put up a, a new quality assurance body um, to validate uh, training and development specifically from a skills base. And I think that's been a gap uh, in our market uh, um, for a long time. So it's important that you notice that the QCTO is there. In the future, it's going to affect us uh, a lot as soon as they, uh, they get up to speed. Okay, so that is the new situation. And we're going to look a little further. Just a bit of a summary of WSP submissions per subsector. And we highlighted information technology that uh, we deal with quite a number of, of CETAs. Um, that the MICT CETA, or the MIG CETA as they call it, it's not a Russian plane. Um, it is uh, a CETA in our uh, context. Um, if we just go and look there, 34% of companies that are registered, um, and I've got the L number, L number, they don't submit WSPs and ATRs. You say that's quite a lot, but if you look at the detail, you'll see that large and medium companies, 94, 93% actually submit, and they get back. So it's, it's only the small companies that don't really participate in that. And a lot of them might find it's not worth their while. There's not enough to uh, claim back. Um, but yes, there are SDFs that are freelance that will take a number of companies and would be able to do those services uh, for them. So this just gives you a, a bit of an idea what uh, is happening. I think companies are quite involved at this stage, specifically large and medium companies. Okay, let's just have a quick look. The legislation that drives mandatory and discretionary grant system, Skills Development Levies Act, the Skills Development Act, and the Employment Equity Act. If you look at the new BE generic scorecard, um, there's 20 point weight for skills development, um, and those 20 points are up for grabs for people that take skills development seriously. So make sure, you know, that that's a huge benefit. A lot of companies do quite a few interventions to get those, uh, those points. What I say, if you're going to do an intervention, don't do it just for the points, do it for upliftment and skilling people to, uh, to a higher level um, and make a contribution that way. Okay, now here's some very important things. The training years runs from 1 April to March 2014. Um, three months for WSBH part to complete it and submit it to the relevant CETA. Now, if you look at that, that's got implications. That means next year's WSP ATR submission has to be before 30 April. And I, I'll, I'll reiterate that a little later. Mandatory grants are paid to employers that have submitted WSPs and ATRs by the deadline date in the year and have received a clean audit from the CETA. And you apply for a discretionary grant and the CETA agreed to such grant provided that all statutory criteria is in place. Um, make sure that you stick to the annual deadlines specifically because there's a change now. Companies must submit 
an ATR annual training report and an employment equity report and a workplace skills plan. Um, projection of training plans for staff training period 1 April to 31 March and, and that is uh, for the future I think is going to stay there. It must, <coughs> now this is very very important, you need to submit your um, WSP and ATR before 30 June but don't submit it, try and submit it on the 30th of June because it is a Sunday. <laughs> um, that's not really going to be very helpful. Make sure it's uh, in by uh, Friday the 28th, preferably two weeks before the time. Because you, if you're in front of the queue, your WSP and ATR will be vetted earlier. That means you can get going with discretionary grants and put in all sorts of other things earlier. Um, so make sure that you're not in the end of the queue with the rush. Um, from 2014, must be submitted by 30 April um, and must be submitted by a registered SDF. Um, okay, and that change is significant because now we have a training year of only virtually eight, nine months, which we didn't have previously. Um, but from the year afterwards, from 2015, that will stabilize. Now, a new thing is submit a pivotal training plan if you want access to the discretionary grant. If you're not going to submit a pivotal training plan, you will find that you won't have access to that money that used to be part of your mandatory grant uh, in the past. And then uh, an employment equity um, report must be submitted by the end of October if it's by hand and 15 January if you do it uh, online. Okay, who must submit? Firstly, um, companies that have an annual payroll of over 500,000 and um, they are required by law to submit. Um, so that is very important that you realize that. And uh, if they're not registered with the CETA, then obviously you have to register for the CETA and make sure that you get your L number. If you don't have an L number, you're not registered and it doesn't help you submitting anything because there's no access to the money. Make sure that uh, you are 100% uh, in terms of that. Now, what is the point of submitting? A company can claim back a portion of the funds it spends on training. That's the whole idea. And the claim now, as we said earlier, 20% mandatory, 49.5% discretionary grant, of which 80% of that discretionary grant must be allocated to pivotal <laughs> training programs that address scares and critical skills. Okay, now in your pack you'll find a CD. We've put the scares and critical skills for you on that CD. So that you can see exactly what are the programs and the scares and critical skills you can submit training interventions for to access your um, discretionary grant and what you need to put in your pivotal training uh, plan. So that, that is very important. Um, it relates to professional, vocational, tech, technical, and academic learning. Just one thing that is very important to remember here. If you look at um, what the purpose is, the purpose is to do skills training to a large extent. Academic and skills paired is, is probably the best. Um, but what you find in the market uh, at the moment, we find it a lot in IT. Um, the, M the MICT CETA has over 2,000 graduates that can't find jobs in IT. Why can't they find jobs? They graduated from universities and, and some from universities of technology because they don't have any skills. If you study IT today, you will find that most of those, uh, and I've got a, a son that is studying you know, at the University of Victoria at the moment, he has to teach himself program. The university is not teaching him any, any skills. That's not their role, they don't see it as that. They're teaching them the theory, and then they have to give them all sorts of exercises they need to teach themselves. Um, and if you are not development orientated, you rather want to go for networking or something like that, you come out of university, you've got all that 
theoretical information, but you've never configured a server or put a system together before, apart from for games, they're very good at that, um, but not in business terms. So there's, there's very little use they have for companies in terms of their skills. And what they want to do here is specifically address that part and make sure that you start with skills training to get those people economically active. So that is really the purpose. Okay, let's look at Pivotal. It improves the quality and quantity of labor market information received by the CETA in form of uh, WSP, ATR and Pivotal training reports. Remember that that scares and critical list comes from the WSP and ATRs that have been submitted by the member companies of those CETAs. That is the information that they're giving to us. And if you look at those CETA reports, um, they're quite thick and, and they've got a lot of information, but a lot of the time they have a lot of useful information in them. Information that you can use to compile your own WSP and ATR and compare it with what your company is doing. Scarce and critical skills are defined as an absolute or relative demand, current or in future. Note for skilled, qualified and experienced people to fill particular roles, professions, occupations or specialisations in the labour market. Pivotal grants also promote NQF registered quality assured programmes. Now why do they do that? Because an uh, uh, NQF level 5, for instance, uh, is lower than somebody with a diploma or something, but it's skills orientated. Why do they want those programs? Because those programs are assessed, they are moderated, they are verified. It's a process that you go through. POEs are compiled to make sure that the transfer of learning is taken place. Very, very important. Um, and, and that makes it a little bit more powerful. What we do is we pair it with certification to make it a lot more powerful, to validate industry-related uh, skills. Okay, who's eligible for pivotal funding? A learner who's enrolled on a learnership or has completed a learnership or any other qualification? Um, employed and unemployed learners who have successfully completed a course of study. Do you note they're not looking in essence for unemployed youth in, in skilling now directly. They're more looking at skilling people to higher levels. Um, and I think that is, that is a major change in the attitude to its development. Okay, pivotal funding criteria, professional player placements, work integrated learning, apprenticeships, learnerships, skills programs, internship, workplace experience placements. That means there's a whole range of things you'll be able to claim on or put on your pivotal training plan. But make sure that it's related to skills and critical skills. If it's not, you're going to battle to get it approved. Um, and what is nice, if you really look at it, if you do it properly, you could have a funding kitty from year to year where all your training and development at least in, in uh, about 80% is funded. So, so I think that's critical to do it properly. Okay, the MICT CETA grant shall be applied through a letter of intent as provided by the MICT CETA on its website. That's just them. We deal a lot with them. We deal also the LG CETA, Services CETA, um, and Construction CETA. There's all those, those nice uh, places. All the letter of intents are on their website. It's an easy download. Um, I think on the CD you'll find the MICTC does one. Um, so what happens? You put it in your WSP under discretionary grants, pivotal training plan, and make sure you've got it in there. Once that has been submitted and approved, then you can submit a letter of intent. And I think there's going to be a lot more negotiation with the CETA in terms of these interventions. What we will do is we will have to engage with them to show them what the purpose of the training is and where we want to take it. So you will find that it's very important that you have a good relationship with your CETA. Even though you think it might not be possible, it is possible. Ask us. You know, we've got a CETA tent, and you're not allowed to tell this to anybody outside this room. Um, and if we don't get something from the CETA, um, our academic manager or our SDF gets to spend time in pitch that tent in front of the MICT CETA 
offices on the lawn and they stay there until they get what they need. It works like a charm. We always have our certificates in time. I don't know how we do it, but somehow the relationship is now of such a level that we can do that. Um, I think the services seat is a bit less at this stage. I think they've had a bit of a setback. They're a bit behind, but it's starting to get there again as well. In certain circumstances, a co-funding approach shall be employed. Um, there's a funding partnership between the CETA and uh, the implementing company. Um, all CETAs are different in terms of uh, how they do it. The MICT CETA wants you to fund half of the, the learnership in terms of the training money um, and they will fund the stipend um, so that they can do double the amount of, of learners uh, on programs. Other CETAs give the full amount. They, they all um, have their slight different rules within the system. So just make sure that uh, you try and get the best possible deal in terms of what they do. Okay, qualifying companies that implement uh, MICT are pivotal programs in rural areas and those that target people with disabilities shall be eligible for a 100% um, pivotal grant. Just please take note of that. So if you do a nice project in rural areas, there's a 100% on the table for that. And I'm going to share a little bit of a case study with you, you later on, on that as well. This is your favorite training needs analysis. We're all familiar with that, I hope. Um, it's when you send out those nice questionnaires and forms and so on to line managers and they immediately send them back completed. <laughs> well, yeah. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen that way. You have to beg, borrow, or steal them to get them back. I know um, that always has been a problem. Um, but yes, I think it's important that um, we look at a number of things, and I just want to go through some of them. I think you all are fair with uh, training needs analysis. The review the sector skills plan. That thick document. Have a look at it. There's good information in there. There's also some information that you can disregard. Um, questionnaire sent to managers, interviews of employees, review of employment equity report, analysis of the organization's strategic goals. That is a key element. If you, you know where your company is going, then you know what skills you would be needing in the next five to ten years. If that is not part of your WSP process of developing people in the company, you will always be found wanting. You will never have the right skills and all we do is we recruit people from other companies and we put up the price of uh, salaries for those scarce skills. Um, and in IT I know there's a few people that are being rotated to, among the top companies, all they get is better salaries, you know. Um, that is really not the purpose. The purpose is to get more people into those levels. Um, and specifically understanding where we're going, what technology we're going to deploy, or if it's in construction, you know, what sort of construction we're going to do, and um, in services, what sort of service is going to be, you need to determine what skills will be required for the future. Um, and I think, you know, preferably, top management should be involved in that. Um, because they're always the people that moan with HR people because they can't find the right skills. But if they're not committed to developing them, it becomes quite difficult. Okay, operational objectives, that's the immediate ones. That's uh, all the recruitment, you have to immediately get somebody highly skilled for something, we all understand that, BE requirements, possible staff movements, Skills priorities, scares and critical skills. Have a look at that list. That's really quite helpful. If we look in the IT context, there's about 7,000 um, programming developed for related jobs. About 3,000 on the networking side. That's a huge amount of people. At this stage in our BI classes, uh, when they're at NQF level six, those people are normally employed already in October before they, they complete their courses. Why? Because there's such a need in the market. If you phone us in January and say, Ronald, I want your top 10 
programmers, I'm going to laugh at you, say you just missed the boat. Maybe we should engage in a different level and I can assist you developing them over a period of time to a PI level. And we've got good examples uh, um, of that. Job descriptions, performance appraisals, personal development plans, training committee minutes. Make sure that uh, you have that training committee system going to the best of your ability. If you get top buy-in, it's easy. If you don't get, if you invite the MD and he attends the meeting, you know, then the line manager's all there and they're all very enthusiastic. Otherwise, they're not. The training committee must approve the training uh, needs analysis report. Um, and they also should approve the providers in conjunction with the FD, the financial director is always your key person in getting money, and uh, the training priorities are identified in the training needs analysis. Now for small companies where they don't really have this whole system going, that is where you get an external SDF. Um, we've just done it for a, a small company, a small development company, um, they had, what, five employees, and now they're up to 25. Um, this year, for the first time, they're starting to submit things. They've got highly skilled people, so they've got a, a fairly sizable wage bill, um, and they are growing rapidly at this stage. So they're entering into this, and I think next year, for the first time, they'll be able to, to get some money back for the development that they are doing. Okay, let's have a look. How much can we claim? 20% of the levies that have been paid. Um, make sure that you, uh, you understand that. It's not 50%, it's 20% now from your mandatory uh, grant. What levies does one pay? You all know it's 1% of your payroll. What you can claim for, this is always very interesting, cost of employing an SDF or a training manager. Um, Training materials, facilitator costs, course fees, accommodation and travel, venue, admin and stationery. And if you have a, a nice big uh, conference somewhere um, where you get everybody together, you can claim that. CETAs are not here, we can openly say that. <laughs> and it's valid and it's legal and uh, we do that, we, get, uh, we do a lot of training internally in our, in our company and we have three or four interventions where you bring everybody from all over the country together. There's about uh, 60, 70 people, normally we do it in a, at a hotel, um, and we can claim that back. And it's, it's uh, um, accepted every year. So, so remember, also cost of a SDF or training manager can be claimed back. It's not uh, abnormal at all. Um, economic Accommodation, travel, and venue. I don't think it includes a lot of liquor. It depends how big the account is. <laughs> you can try it. You can try it. <laughs> okay. What, what is the role of the SDF? Develop a WSP. Promote, coordinate, and implement training interventions. And then report on the training in an ATR. Okay. Now, very important. All the money you get back from the CETA is not for increases and bonuses. Please remember that. If you thought it was for that, negotiate for your bonus outside of that. Um, the whole idea of it is to create a training kitty if you're in the system that will revolve every year so that you always have enough money for training and development over a period of time. Um, and if you do that properly, it's fantastic because in essence, about 80% of all the training and development you're doing, specifically in larger organizations, pay for, um, which is a great system. Types of training for which you can claim, <coughs> bursaries, internships, learnerships, learnerships or apprenticeships, work integrated learning, and RPL. As so we started with that a couple of years ago, I met with uh, the CETA, we, we battled initially, and we are now in the system. I think last year we did about 120. This year we're looking at doing about 300 RPLs. It is growing very much at the moment. Because remember, in the new system, if somebody has been successfully RPL'd, you're going into the scarce and critical skills band. So that is an ideal, and I think RPL is really going to pick up momentum 
because of the whole focus on higher level skills training. So, so make sure that you uh, know that. Um, okay, and let's quickly look at what uh, the SDF has to do. Facilitate strategic planning processes within the organization regarding to identify and addressing the skills needs of the organization. It, it is so important that you're not only sitting at the bottom level, but that you are involved at a top level if people are serious about training and development. Facilitate payments of skills development levies to SARS, submit annual skills development reports, and monitor payments from the CETA. That monitor is a very nice word. It's called harass the CETA to get your money. Um, and we'll, we'll speak a little bit more about that. That is a real engagement with the CETA to make sure that not only money, but anything you need from them, you're going to have to fight for to get back. So build that relationship. Don't scream and shout at them, it doesn't work. Okay, let's just look at learnerships and internships. There's a whole focus on this um, in terms of the new, uh, the new rules and regulations. They're looking at this as a work-based route to qualification. And we'd like to add certification to that. Uh, and if there's no specific statutory time period within which a CETA must pay monies for learners on learnerships or, or internships, um, and there's no statutory time within approval must be granted once an application has been made to the CETA, and each CETA makes its own rules in this regard. Um, it means that you're going to engage with them. I know some CETAs have four payments on milestones of reports that you submit. Some only have two. LG CETA, I think, have two of them. You get half the money up front and then the, the other half uh, um, at the end or at a certain milestone. Um, there are other CETAs that do it slightly different. They give all the money to the employer um, from the start. So, depending on with which CETA you registered, you have to engage and make sure that you understand what their rules regarding this is, so you're not out of pocket in doing a, an intervention. Okay, and it's a 12-month work-based route to full national qualifications. We've got 17 at the moment, registered with various CETAs of our own. There is good news too. SARS tax rebates. Employers can apply for tax rebates to SARS for hosting learners on learnerships. And for 18.1 learners to up to 50,000 and 18.2 learners up to 60,000. 18.1 learners are currently employed people in your organization. 18.2 learners are unemployed youth or and a youth in South Africa is somebody between 18 and 35 years old. See a lot of youthful people in the room. <laughs> so you can go on a learnership if you're below 35. If you're above, sorry, you just missed it. I just missed it, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Disabled learners up to 100,000. Okay, just very important. When those learners walk in and you break their legs, you can, you can get 100,000 back. <laughs> Not recommended, but uh, certainly is... Uh, <laughs> is one of the things that we don't encourage employers to do, but uh, I'm scared that it might happen. Okay, that is very nice. I think one should really look at trying to um, get a disabled person if you, if you haven't got them already, because there's money for them to be trained, and there's a lot more um, for blind people, for people with all sorts of disablement. They, they, they are certainly... Uh, um, ways of developing them. Okay, so that is the good news. So if you have a shortfall on the money that you get from the CETA, you can tap into your um, uh, your SARS rebate and you can tell your financial director that. You know, say, um, I, I need another 20 or 30,000 rand for this kind of intervention, you know, but we, we want to take only half of the money you're going to put back into profits uh, to use for that. Okay, let's just look at a business rationale. Um, this is focused on the MIG CETA, the Russian CETA. Um, CETA provides training grant including stipend, 53,000 rand per learner, 
35 for the training and 18,000 for the stipend. That works to 1,500 uh, for the stipend. A stipend we call beer and travel money, so that they can get. Oh no, I got that wrong. <laughs> travel and beer money, because if they start with the beer, then they're not going to get to the travel. Um, to get to the workplace or, or the training institution where they have the uh, the intervention. Then, of course, you've got the tax rebate as part of that to top up funding. Um, and what they say, it reduces the cost of recruitment. That is very true. If you, let's say, have a requirement for, for 12 people in a specific area, I wouldn't train only 12 people. I would go up, depending on what the area it is, go up to 20 because you want to select people out of that group. Don't just go for what your requirements are. Look at what, how many people fall out. If I look currently, what they're saying is they want a 70% placement of learners. What pressure does that put on us as HR and training and development professionals? It means our selection criteria has to go up drastically. You can't just grab a lot of people from the street and put them on a learnership or internship or skills, pro skills development program or anything else. Select them very carefully because what you're busy with, you're busy with trying to get skilled people in your organization. And that, so it's very, very important that if you select good people, you will find that you, uh, you'll get a good result. One of the examples I've got, uh, um, yeah, it's here in Pretoria, the company that does Google Maps averages. Um, in South Africa, they did a little intervention with us. Anybody from Africa just yeah? Not. Um, and uh, they put 10 developers in a program, and the, the MD came and he did a very, very tough speech to these poor 10 kids. And uh, I actually felt sorry for them. I little, felt a little bit guilty because I thought I'd done something wrong as well, but I'm not sure how that completely worked out. But at the end of the day, I did a little motivational speech, and they all, they all started with their program, they passed the international exams, they passed the program, and um, one of them is now full-time employed. I'm not that happy about it, I wanted him to do a second year as well, to do his BI training at the same time. The other nine are now doing BI, I think they might employ another one or two of them, but they've already identified from their clients where they will be placing people. And with developers at BI level past the exams, I will place them too. It's very easy to do that because there's quite a need in the market uh, for developers. Scares and critical skills report says 7,000. If that says 7,000, it's probably closer to 15. So that, that gives you a good idea of what can be done. And all 10 of them passed. We haven't lost anyone there because normally we lose a few people. There are unemployable people in, uh, in the world. We, do a, we call on employers a lot of time for our students to do workplace experience. And sometimes we send you a dot, or they just don't pitch. Made the appointment, everything, organized everything. And we don't nail them. We just say, send them back. They're obviously not mature enough to be in a workplace. We're not going to destroy them for life because of that, but we say you need another two years of at least proper training to get you to a level where you'd be able to interact in a workplace. Um, and we'll send you another body because there are always people eager to, to do that. For internships, you're looking at 70,000 rand per learner, but there's no tax rebate. Remember, the stipend is set at 3,500 rand. That's for the MICT CETA. Sometimes there's a little bit of a difference across CETAs. The whole idea is to get to the higher levels, and that's why they pay them a little bit of more money because they already have a qualification when they go on an intervention. And again, the same thing is very important. Um, we put an ad on the uh, skills portal the other day for an internship. An uh, employer wanted to, uh, to have uh, people that are already qualified. With, within five days, we had 200 applications for internship from qualified people. They, they are there, and they are hungry for jobs. Um, and I think, you know, what is happening now is a fantastic vehicle to get them into those jobs. 
Okay. Now this is where CTU comes in. You know that you have to submit before the 28th of June, preferably by the 14th, but if the line managers don't play ball, at least the 28th, get it in. The, that is your first very important thing. Also note that next year it is before 30 April that you have to um, hand in your ATR and your WSP. That's only, what, eight months, nine months away from your initial submission. That means to get your WSP back and uh, um, approved and your ATR as well is very, very important. You're going to have put a lot of pressure on the CETA to, to, to get that back soon so that you can start with your um, discretionary grant and pivotal training plan. If, you, if you've got a sharp CETA, you can still be able to do it this year, otherwise it's going to have to start in the beginning of next year. Okay, just a little bit about what we do in terms of our human resource development uh, wheel. Um, we've got career students currently that are doing NKF level 3, 4, 5 and 6. Um, and if you've got a specific need in either IT, graphics, um, in drafting, um, development and uh, um, networking, then there's opportunity to maybe take some of those students for a second year. And what is nice about it, they fall into our standard programs. You don't have to have 20 or 30 or whatever. You can do five or four or whatever the case might be, as long as they fall in a standard program. The moment we're looking at a specific intervention for your organization, then um, there has to be larger numbers uh, most of the time if it's not in a standardized program where it fits in. And the other thing that is nice about it, we can do it countrywide. We've done a number of interventions for companies um, in all locations. In, in this financial environment, we have open branches in Cape Town and in PE and in KwaZulu-Natal um, to complete our footprint. And most of those branches are running on interventions like these. They are open because employers wanted skills development in, in, in those specific areas. Then we're looking at the learnerships and internships and upskilling. You can take a program for skills and critical skills that is only certification and try and put that in your pivotal training program so it's slightly shorter. I just find when you put people on these corporate programs where it's a five-day intensive program for experienced professionals, when you take somebody that's just a graduate, who's got little experience, they don't cope on those programs. It's always better to give them a little bit more time to do proper learning. Um, for professionals, not necessary. You know, they been in the field that's sufficient. They only really go for the practical skill side anyway. For the labs, it's most important uh, for them to understand, to be able to do um, the, the job properly. Internships, it's, it's a fantastic way of uh, developing them, them as well. Just to give you a bit of a model, and I'm, I'm rather going to go to this one, what we've done is we've paired qualification and certification. That has been our competitive advantage for a long time. Now we've taken hands with Cisco and we're currently doing CCNPs on an NKF level 5 and they all come out with the certification, CCNP, in terms of Cisco, um, which is pretty, uh, pretty well done. They all pass the exams, it's a year program um, and it's paired to NKF level 5. A normal learnership or internship disbursement is not going to be enough for that. You'll find probably half of that you'll be able to fund. The rest will have to be a top up in terms of making sure certification is done. Training very expensive. The uh, trainers are very expensive. They're highly trained. They go through a very tough train the trainer program. I've never seen people sweat that much. Uh, in they've done all these things, they've got all the experience, and you put them in a lab exam for eight hours, you know, they come out totally gone. The next day they have to do proper presentations, specifically structured, etc. And not all of them pass. So when somebody has passed that, you know he's of high quality. So <coughs> that, that gives you a Cisco route, and then you can go into uh, specialization. You can go and have a look at uh, putting them into 
uh, data warehousing, unified communication, special projects, you know, whatever direction you require. Um, this we haven't done yet. Um, we are looking at putting that on the NKF level 6. NKF level 5 is, is running currently in a number of locations. Not all locations, but uh, major locations it's running. And we finding I was in PE last week. No, this week. Where's the time gone? And we had a lot of inquiries for Cisco there, so we might likely do an intervention there um, later this year or starting later this year or next year. Microsoft well established, both development and uh, networking. We take them right up to NKF level 6. We registered our own programs at NKF level 6 with uh, um, SOCWA and uh, they are registered now as learnerships, I think, as we speak. I saw the MD of uh, MICTC um, two weeks ago, Opam Parke, and he doesn't normally see training providers quite happy to, uh, to have a discussion. And the whole discussion went, went about skills and critical skills and really vendor specific because they've always been very negative to us vendor specific and they're not anymore. The other question I also asked him is, well, what about progressional learning? Why, why can't we take somebody from an NKF level 4 to a 5 to a 6? And he said, the only problem they have to commit to that is they are funded annually. So they can't make a commitment for three years. But what they can do is if you come to them and have a discussion with the intention to do more than one year, um, they will now look at it quite favorably. I don't know if the other seaters are, are similar. So as long as we in the skills and critical skills, because they have a huge amount of pressure to get that right as well. Okay, and then uh, one of the new things, we have just uh, um, concluded an agreement with Obsidian. It's one of the open source houses in South Africa that gives us access to their facilitator. So we registered as a Red Hat uh, trading provider and we're pairing it again to NKF levels. Now this is not, it's in your pack, it's not uh, in concrete. I think it's a process where if you want to do something like that, let's sit down and have a look what your needs and requirements are and, and pair a proper program for you, specifically if you've got a number of people. If you've got smaller numbers, then they have to slot into the standardized one and one can always do add-ons if you, if you want to. Last one is HP. We are now going into the ATA networks and we're busy negotiating to do a learnership for them as well. So if you're into that space, maybe it's a good uh, thing to engage uh, as well. Then we also have the call center uh, learnerships currently that we can do and, and a number of others, project management, drafting, whatever the case might be. Okay, now here comes the call to action part and I think you get lots of calls to action already. One of the key things you need to remember, we are currently all over the country. Every single province we have a representation. And uh, so if you want to do an intervention in five or six areas, that is quite possible. And it makes it a lot easier. What we find at the moment is Microsoft brings us lots of projects specifically in play, like men's and PE. Five years ago, they begged me to open a branch there and I, I don't like the coastal area so much because everything's so, so much slower there. Um, <laughs> business too, normally. Um, so eventually we open up and I think we've had a fantastic response from PE. Okay, what do you need to do? The first thing, you need to identify a developmental model in your organization that links to your strategy and objectives. And you must make sure that you've got that preferably five to ten years and you can adjust it every year to make sure that you as a uh, HR and development professional fulfill the skills requirements for your company um, because that is what is required of you. So very important that that is in place. Second thing, make sure your WSP is in latest June for mandatory, discretionary and pivotal training plans. If you don't put in the pivotal training plan as part of your discretionary grant, you only have 10% really of, of the 49.5 that you're going to get back. Um, and I think there's a lot of 
companies that are not going to do this this first round, and there's going to be quite a few HR people in a spot of bother, I would say, uh, in the next couple of months. Okay, submit your letter of intent. Um, by August, September, of, after receiving a WSP ATR approval from the CETA, very important, the moment you've got your WSP ATR approved, Submit that letter of intent. There was a meeting the other day with the MICT CETA. They kept everything back, all the letter of intent, because they were waiting for this to come through. And the employers were furious. The large IT companies nothing because they kept it back. It was a, a pretty heated meeting. Unfortunately, they were holding some of ours are also held back at this stage. So we're waiting for that to, to happen now in the next uh, two months. Harass the CETA. You know, you need to be on top of them every single day. Even if you've got a secretary or somebody phoning them every day, you build that relationship with the, the CETA. You have to do this. Um, because once you get your uh, approval and then you submit your letter of intent, that letter of intent needs to be approved. After that letter of intent, you need to get your SLA, Service Level Agreement. And that Service Level Agreement <coughs> contains all the elements of the intervention you want to do, including the disbursements, etc., that goes with it. If you don't do that, then you're going to find that you're not going to do this year's training this year. In essence, most likely, I think a lot of the training will start being of next year. If I look at how we've been going up till now. If you're on the ball, you can still get it done this year. If your seat is on the ball and everybody works together, you can still uh, be done. So the harassment factor is very, very important. If you want to borrow our tent, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, and then in reality, if you've got large business, you can start it this year in terms of learnerships. I, I think realistically, we're going to see most of the interventions starting next year. Um, I'd love to see case study sooner than that. Um, I think the stuff that has been in the pipe already, they will be most likely approved uh, uh, because the CETAs are under pressure. So that is really what needs to happen um, within, within this year. Okay, those are just very nice things that people say about us. Uh, um, what I want to try and bring across is a passion for the development of people and specifically in this country where there's such a scarcity of proper skills. If we look at how many positions are not filled in this country at the moment, it's absolutely terrible in relation to our unemployment. Um, and I think, you know, we underestimate a lot of, a lot of the time what simple interventions can do um, and what changes they can make in people's lives. I, I just want to say a little bit about the rural areas, you know, um, we are involved in a numerous projects trying to uplift uh, people um, in schools and one of uh, um, our pet projects has been the upliftment of FET colleges. FET colleges, Bladen Samani has put a huge emphasis on that and they've given them all sorts of money. We went into one in uh, Umtata to do an upliftment program with Microsoft and you know the level of their diplomas and things, that curriculum has been changed in 35 years or something like that. It, it's useless. It really is terrible that you look at what comes out of it and they're screaming for um, upliftment and empowerment and, and we have been part of, of one of those projects we are now looking at most likely taking hands with Microsoft and the Department of Education to see if we can do a lot more of those. Um, and you know I've got a little pet project that uh, out of that I want to empower FET colleges, train PC techs to go into the schools to set up those labs that are still in boxes that are not being used. I also want to, and I don't know if we're going to get this right, train people on EUC and user computing to get all the kids 
in the FET college, trained at least on Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and Outlook, and the same trying to do that uh, at the schools, to start getting basic IT skills um, into environments where it's really non-existent. Um, and, you know, if you're involved in CSI and you want to be involved in a project like this, you know, you're welcome to contact us. It is outside, most likely, the scope of what we, we're saying now, talking about now. But you will find that it makes a huge difference in their lives. Our Tata project is coming to, a com to completion now. On the 14th, we've got our graduation there for uh, the learners that uh, were trained there. And the whole idea is to empower that college to start doing those programs. And our CTU is really not scared of getting all the FET colleges up and running with IT. Um, they will do the base skills. They, it's going to be very difficult for them to do high-level programs. It is specialised. You need a, 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 the right environment, everything to get that right. Because the whole idea is empowerment. It's not taking over. And and we hopefully going to get go to the next level now um, and uh, uh, take the IT techs to uh, system support. That would be a fantastic achievement if we get it right. Um, it looks like the MIC, PCTA and Microsoft is going to play a game on that, so hopefully we uh, will be able to pull that through. And the, the employers in the area were very, very positive and they embraced the whole project. So workplace experience, I think some of the technicians are working at IT training colleges already in Umtata. So there's a lot of things that have happened around us that gives you a positive outcome. Now, you've seen two videos now today. If you look on YouTube, we've got about 68 videos or 70, around 70 videos at this stage. I know how tough it is as an HR person to get things in your, happening in your organizations. Um, we do video reporting. If you do an intervention, we will come and, and interview your MD to say why he's doing this intervention and what it's doing for his company automatically you get buy-in. So you profile it. Um, we, we put the learners on. So we profile your whole project within your own organization. You must see what that does. You know, we, we did it for BCX a number of years, you know. Um, every time when the MD couldn't be there, we would go and video him to give a message to the learners when they start up. Um, and you put all those things together and at the end of the day um, you're going to look good as well um, because you profile the the programs in the company with, with the averages one was a very small one they went mad when they got that video they sent it up to Dina Pule right up to the minister so impressed they were with their own work you know um, and and suddenly you know it gives a whole buzz within the company we had the graduation, when was it? Uh, beginning of this year. The beginning of this year. You must see, you, you know, how enthusiastic. They invited the parents, everybody. We do a proper graduation. You need to make people really uplift people into an environment, you know, where they are so motivated and encouraged to study and to work um, that it really makes a great contribution. And, and that is really what the, like, the type of interventions that we would like to uh, like to do. Our, our time in this building is nearly finished. We, uh, we're moving next door. We acquired a, a building and one of the things we want to do is um, brand that building as a center of excellence um, in terms of everything we do. Taking everything to the next level. And we are, we are busy with that now. I think, you know, we should be starting uh, in uh, July and we're probably going to have an opening in, uh, in September where we'll invite a lot of people across to, to celebrate that with us. Um, and, yeah, you know, what I said on the video as well, we, uh, we're the Microsoft Learning Part of the Year 2010-2012. And we just received an award from them. That's our first international award uh, for being the country partner of the year. Now, the first question I got from the CTU staff is, what does that mean? <laughs> because it could mean nothing. But it's really, we have engaged with them at so many different levels in projects, 
and in initiatives that are innovative to the benefit of our mutual customers, um, that they have voted us as the best Microsoft partner in South Africa at this stage, which is to us a great honor, and it just shows our commitment to that. Um, so, uh, you know, you, some of the first that hear it will start the marketing process, obviously, you hear a lot more about that. And I think it's just the beginning of, of a lot of awards that will be coming uh, forward. And the reason why we get those awards, we have a passion for the development of people. That is really what we are about. And uh, I'd like to extend that passion to you, not only in IT or the other products we do, but in everything you do as an HR and development professional. Really, really see if you can make a difference in the lives of other people. Thank you very much.